Good evening and welcome to From the Stacks, the weekly live stream program of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. I'm Cal Beisner, and our guests tonight will be David Legates and Christopher Essex. More about them in a little bit. Uh, first, just a little bit about the Cornwall Alliance. We are a network of just under 70 scholars, uh, about a third natural scientists, a third economists, and a third theologians and philosophers and ethicists dedicated to educating the public and policymakers on three things inter uh, what, intertwined with each other and simultaneously. Uh, biblical earth stewardship, economic development for the very poor, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we interact with a lot of different scholars over the years and just really enjoy uh, stretching our minds and stretching our, our listeners and our readers' minds. You can find out a lot more about us at cornwallalliance.org. That's cornwallalliance.org. Uh, our topic this evening is going to be all about computer climate models. Last month, two-time Pulitzer Prize winning science journalist Robert Lee Holtz shocked the world with an article in the Wall Street Journal that exposed the many reasons why computer model forecasts of, uh, of future climate on which the world's governments depend for their climate and energy policies fail constantly, miserably, totally to provide credible forecasts. Uh, so this evening on our program, we will be discussing that. Uh, first though, I wanna just uh, inform you of a special offer that the Cornwall Alliance has going this month. Every month we offer some sort of a, a special uh, educational tool uh, as our way of saying thank you when you make a donation of literally any size and request it. Uh, this month, we're offering uh, the booklet Social Justice versus Biblical Justice, How Good Intentions Undermine Justice and Gospel, something that I wrote uh, initially back uh, about, about uh, nine years ago at the request of the Family Research Council and then uh, revised and enlarged it uh, somewhat for this new edition. And a lot of people have found this very, very helpful in this age of the woke, progressive, uh, social justice warriors, critical race theory uh, movements <laughs> intertwined with each other. And uh, this, this booklet uh, offers a, a carefully developed biblical definition of justice as rendering impartially and proportionally to everyone his due according to the righteous standard of God's moral law. And then it compares that definition of justice with ideas uh, going around the landscape presented as social justice or as, uh, as critical race theory and things of that sort. And it measures those ideas with the biblical understanding. To request your copy, just go to cornwallalliance.org and uh, click on the donate button. And as you fill out the donation form, when you come to the comments field, write in promo code 22-03. That's promo code 22-03 or the title social justice. And we'll be glad to send you, in this case, not just one copy, but two. A lot of people have already asked for this from us in the past, uh, even over a couple of years. They found it very, very useful. And so this time we decided we wanna offer two. Uh, maybe you've never seen it before. You have one for yourself. Uh, maybe in either case, you've got at least one, maybe two to give to other people who you think would benefit from them. So now I uh, would like to introduce uh, my two guests for this evening. Uh, one, I probably shouldn't even call a guest anymore. Dr. David Legates is now the uh, uh, Director of Research and Education for the Cornwall Alliance. Uh, David came on uh, half time with us in the middle of January. He is uh, retired from a long and distinguished career as uh, in, in teaching climatology and geography and, and meteorology and all sorts of related things at the University of Delaware. Uh, he's <clears throat> He's the author or co-author of over 150 refereed journal articles. Uh, not, a, not a bad production for a career. And uh, he's also the co-author of the third edition of uh, the late uh, Dr. Fred Singer's book, uh, Hot Talk, 
called Science, Global Warming's Unfinished Debate, along with another uh, Cornwall Alliance scholar, uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony, uh, oh, come on, Tony, David, help Lupo. me. <laughs> Lupo. <laughs> Anthony Lupo. Yeah, Tony Lupo of the University of Missouri, also a climate scientist. So we're really glad to have David on with us. Our other guest tonight is uh, our good friend, uh, Dr. Christopher Essex. Chris is a uh, professor of physics and, and uh, applied mathematics, and I think several other things. Huh. Uh, he just recently, uh, he just recently uh, went through some uh, change in titles there, taking on some new responsibilities he told me about. Uh, I just got informed by our producer that we have lost uh, Chris's video. We may be able to get it back shortly, uh, but I, I will assure you that Chris is not just a black box. Well, <laughs> maybe he is. I'm here. I mean, yeah. <laughs> he, Can you hear me? he is here, but his mind is so deep that perhaps black box would be a good way to refer to Chris. Uh, yeah. But thank you very much for Chris, uh, Chris for joining us tonight. And thank you, David, as well. I just think you should know that my name is misspelled. Oh, two X's should be two S's. <laughs> ah. Okay, we'll try to get that taken care of. Christopher Essex, E-S-S-E-X. -S -S -E there we go. Got Good, it. thank you. Okay, so thank you much, very, uh, David and Chris, for, for joining us this evening. Uh, our, our springboard for discussion tonight is an article from the February 7 Wall Street Journal titled, Climate Scientists Encounter Limits of Computer Models, Bedeviling Policy. Subtitle is supercomputer simulations are running up against the complex physics of programming thousands of weather variables, such as the extensive impact of clouds. Uh, I've often said that uh, the Earth's climate system is probably the most complex natural system we've ever studied, with the possible exception of DNA and the human brain. It has literally thousands of uh, components and for many of them, uh, we, don't, we, we really don't know how they interact, and we really can't measure them very well, well at all. And consequently, when we try to model them, we have to just sort of plug in. Uh, we have to parameterize a variety of different figures in them. And then besides that, there's the issue that the climate system is a coupled, uh, nonlinear, chaotic, uh, fluid dynamic system. And therefore, there are some fundamental reasons in mathematics and physics why, even if we can model it, we can't necessarily, uh, in fact, we probably cannot at all be confident that the results that our models yield uh, would be true even if all the different quantities that we enter into the thousands of different uh, parameters were right. So we're going to discuss this. I, I want actually to introduce our discussion by quoting the first, oh, maybe sixth or seventh of the article for us. And it's an interesting read, and I think you'll all appreciate it. So here we go. For almost five years, an international consortium of scientists was chasing clouds, determined to solve a problem that bedeviled climate change forecasts for a generation. How do these wisps of water vapor affect global warming? They reworked 2.1 million lines of supercomputer code used to explore the future of climate change, adding more intricate equations for clouds and hundreds of other improvements. They tested the equations, debugged them, and tested again. The scientists would find that even the best tools at hand can't model climates with the sureness the world needs as rising temperatures impact almost every region. When they ran the updated simulation in 2018, the conclusion jolted them. Earth's atmosphere was much more sensitive to greenhouse gases than decades of previous models had predicted, and future temperatures could be much higher than feared. 
perhaps even beyond hope of practical remedy. We thought this was really strange, said Gokan Danabasaglu. Uh, sure, I butchered that last name. But, uh, chief scientist for the Climate Model Project at the Mesa Laboratory in Boulder at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR. If that number was correct, he went on, that was really bad news. At least 20 older, simpler global climate models disagreed with the new one at NCAR, an open source model called the Community Earth System Model 2, or CESM2, funded mainly by the U.S. National Science Foundation and arguably the world's most influential climate program. Then, one by one, a dozen climate modeling groups around the world produced similar forecasts. It was not just us, Dr. Dena Basoglu said. You solve one problem and create another, says Andrew Gettleman, right, uh, at the uh, NCAR Mesa Laboratory. The scientists soon concluded their new calculations had been thrown off kilter by the physics of clouds in a warming world, which may amplify or damp climate change. The old way is just wrong. We know that, said Andrew Gettleman, physicist at NCAR who specializes in clouds and helped develop the CESM2 model. I think our higher sensitivity is wrong too, he said. It's probably a consequence of other things we did by making clouds better and more realistic. You solve one problem and create another. Since then, the CESM2 scientists have been reworking their climate change algorithms using a deluge of new information about the effects of rising temperatures to better understand the physics at work. They have abandoned their most extreme calculations of climate sensitivity but their more recent projections of future global warming are still dire and still in flux. As world leaders consider how to limit greenhouse gases, they depend heavily on what computer climate models predict. But as algorithms and the computer they run on become more powerful, able to crunch far more data and do better simulations, the very complexity has left climate scientists grappling with mismatches among competing computer models. While vital to calculating ways to survive a warming world, climate models are hitting a wall. They are running up against four things, the complexity of the physics involved, the limits of scientific computing, uncertainties around the nuances of climate behavior, and the challenge of keeping pace with rising levels of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases. Despite significant improvements, the new models are still too imprecise to be taken at face value, which means climate change projections still require judgment calls. We have a situation where the models are behaving strangely, said Gavin Schmidt, director of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's, that's NASA's, Goddard Institute for Space Studies, a leading center for climate models, uh, modeling. He concluded, we have a conundrum. Well, yes, I think we do have a conundrum and we're gonna have some fun this evening talking about that. So just from completely a layman's standpoint, one of the first things that jumped out on at, at me in this article was the line that says that these computer modelers reworked 2.1 million lines of supercomputer code used to explore the future of climate change. And I'm not a computer geek. I've never done any computer modeling myself, but I, I've done enough writing. I've done enough editing. I've done enough proofreading to know it's really easy for mistakes to creep into things. And when you've got 2.1 million lines, I can't help thinking, what, what are the odds that all 2.1 million of those would be just right? and that there wouldn't be any, any just plain and simple mistakes, maybe typos that are causing problems that could just multiply through the whole thing. Uh, either one of you, you, do, you both do computer modeling. Talk to me about that. You can go first. Right, I want to go ahead, Chris. Or, Chris, go ahead. You want me to go first, okay. <laughs> Well, I, I don't really think that that's the primary concern here, uh, although 
uh, mistakes are easy to make. And, uh, you know, I've worked on codes in the early days that were thousands of lines long. Uh, uh, and, um, yeah, mistakes happen. And they, what you actually wish is the mistakes would be really bad because then they're easy to find. The ones that are just slightly off are actually harder to find. So, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I don't really think that's a primary concern. I, I really don't. I mean, 2 million lines, that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, that, that's not really what the issue is, in my view. I'm not going to say more. Yeah, I so. remember. Okay. David has got to speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I remember um, back in grad school, I had uh, on the corner of my desk, um, it was the code from, I can't remember which model it was, and it was, it was 50,000 lines of code. And I remembered thinking at the time, there can't be a person on the planet that knows everything going on in there. And it, it's almost like um, when you talk about... Uh, um, uh, cells and uh, you know, 99% uh, of all cell mutations are lethal. 99% uh, of all computer code errors wind up in a, a segmentation fault core dump problem. Um, but the idea was now, I mean, it's 50 times greater. And uh, the question has been, what did the old models not have that the new models uh, now have? And the other question becomes, what does the real world have that the current models don't have? And my guess is the real world is probably an infinite number of lines of code. And so what we have is a complicated set of equations that may not in fact represent exactly what, or anything close to what the real world does. And that's the problem with climate modeling. It's, it, it's a very complicated system um, that we don't completely understand. And so we've tried to force into it what we can, uh, but in many cases, we just don't know enough to be able to predict a lot of things on long time scales. And so maybe, maybe that many lines of code isn't enough. Okay. Well, I'd yeah, say that um, there's, a, there's a, more, a, more, a greater problem here. Uh, I think, David, you also brought up this business of maybe a, an infinite number of lines. I, I think you're kind of getting towards something there. Um, I think that people don't comprehend many things here. One of them is that when you get up to 50,000, 150,000 lines, the, the actual code like spelling errors is a problem. But then you have another problem, which is a kind of uh, more difficult one, which is the kinds of behaviors that this code can exhibit. And to try to understand what those are, I mean, it require it can be, be as complex as the system as you're trying you're trying to understand. So, I mean, I remember when I belonged to a GCM group here in Canada, uh, the, the, the computer model was so complex that people were looking for behaviors that they could reproduce in the system. And they're plotting these great big charts because in those days you had paper, uh, but you know, they would look at the contours and they'd say, am I looking for a pattern here? Because even their own code is so complicated that they can't quite understand. It becomes a kind of de facto black box. They don't actually know what's in it, even though they built it. You know, that's it's a it's a it's a something that people don't appreciate on that level. But there's much more to discuss about that. Oh yeah, yeah. And, I remember. Um, go ahead, David. No, I was going to say, I, I remember uh, Tony Broccoli at GFDL had an uh, issue with precipitation in the Southern Pacific. He was trying to figure out why it did weird stuff down there. And he came to the conclusion that it looked like the Andes Mountains were being projected out over the Pacific Ocean. It was a spectrally based model, uh, which simply means it uses a series of code, uh, a series of sine waves and so forth. And he said, well, what we used to do is just simply recognize that once you get out over the oceans, the elevation should be sea level, so we just zero that out. He said, but I decided to plot, what does the model really see in terms of elevation? And of course, the Andes Mountains continued out over the ocean. There were huge mountains and valleys and mountains and valleys. And what the model was generating was all this orographic precipitation effect based upon mountains that physically aren't there, but as far as the model was concerned, it saw them and was <laughs> proceeding down the road exactly like that. And he published, it's an interesting paper that he published, but uh, 
Uh, it, it's yeah. probably why they're getting away from uh, uh, spectrally based modeling. One, 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 All one, right. Well, I was working with a, a spectral based uh, model, and um, that doesn't mean that they don't have advantages too. That kind of model has its That's advantages true. and disadvantages. Right. right. So um, one of the things I remember was that uh, they were having a problem with the mass in the atmosphere oceans. It was gradually decreasing over time and nobody yeah. knew quite what was happening. It was just disappearing, right? And that, of course, that's computational. Yeah. That was a computational problem. And, um, and that kind of problem extends into other uh, systems, you know, sort of finite different systems or whatever. You, you still have bizarre problems like uh, having certain cases where the mass density is negative and things like that. And they said, these are artifacts and everyone knows that they're artifacts, they're not real, but, uh, and so you have to contend with these. And so that's a kind of a, uh, a round off type problem, computational problem. Uh, it, but the thing is that they're not physical. And part of the problem that we're trying to explain this is that people treat computers like some kind of like some kind of a modern day deity that sits on your on your desk and it's it's uh, a kind of um uh kind of kind of a, an authority an oracle and it tells you all truth and you whatever you put in there is true but people don't realize that uh they oh and that mathematics is like an application on the desktop well, i'll do mathematics i'll click on the desktop but the reality is that mathematics is too big to fit into a computer and people don't understand the reality of that because computers all of them even quantum computers have a finite representation so you're stuck with a finite number of numbers and if you're trying to contend with a real physical theory that is entirely uh encapsulated in full mathematics you're missing something or you're always going to be missing something and that has consequences in ways that many people have a kind of conventional knowledge of round off errors and then you have truncation errors because you can't put the actual equations onto a finite representation so the finite number of pixels shall we say or grid points that you can have and what goes on in between the grid points is completely lost so if you wanted to uh, capture something and do proper computing the way we would teach people to do is if you wanted to capture all the features then of the real solution, which you may not actually have in detail, but you might have an idea of how many wiggles there are in this real solution or how close together the wiggles are, you have to make sure that the grids are smaller than the wiggles. Otherwise, you won't get the wiggles that are there actually there. And, and that's called proper computing. You make sure the grid is small enough that all the features that are important are there. The problem is that when you deal with a system like the atmosphere and oceans, you're going to have uh, so much structure and so many, such a range of scales that um, even the fastest computers won't have enough grid points to capture anything and everything. So, what ha so if you actually did it for the Earth's atmosphere, and you would have to go down right down to the size of, of aerosol particles and things like that, which is probably a little bit hard to ask for. But let's say you could just do it for the <laughs> fluids so the, in the atmosphere. Uh, the smallest wiggle that you can get in the atmosphere is typically, it's called the Kolmogorov cutoff, and it's about a millimeter. So if you put a, if you try to do proper computing with the Earth, you'd have to have a millimeter grid. And while they're doing the computation, we'd all have to hold still like an old fashioned camera picture where you're getting a, while the computation's taking place because everything would be jiggled around if we, if all the hummingbirds would have to stop, cars would have to stop while we do this computation. So get our million uh, Wait, millimeter Hold on grid. just a second. Hold on yeah. just a second, Chris, if you will. Yes. You say we'd have to have a millimeter grid. For our viewers who maybe aren't really, uh, uh, steeped in this conversation, it might be helpful to to uh, tell what is the size of the grid? And after all, what kind of a grid are we talking about? Well, here? centimeters why, why about why a half an inch. Refer to this. OK. Uh, what's and, the size and, of the uh, grid in computer climate models? 
Okay, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. I want to go back to my millimeter grid. I'll come back and talk about climate models, which are like hundreds of kilometers, right? I mean, that's, uh, but but if we're talking about a millimeter in order to get all the wiggles, right? That's so uh, we get all mm -hmm. the wiggles, all the turbulence in the thunderstorms and all the turbulence in the, uh, in the, in the upper ocean and so forth. So we're going to try to capture all of that. So let's say a millimeter grid. If you do that and you only have 10 dynamical variables, thermodynamic dynamical variables, and you have one, you want to estimate what happens every second. Once a second, you do a calculate for, for the future and one second time steps. And you use contemporary clock speeds for this calculation. So in order to forecast 10 years in the future using our contemporary computers, you can do a pretty quick back of the envelope estimation that the age of the, or the time of the, of, to do the 10 year calculation, guess what the time would be? Does anyone have an idea, <laughs> David? Uh, uh, how how many ages of the years? universe? Yeah, yeah, it's the age of the universe squared. So that's, uh, <laughs> So that's you know, like 10 to the 20 years. I mean, that's that's what it comes out to be. And of course, I might have used some, you know, different, uh, I don't know, faster computers and parallel computing and knock it down by 10 orders of magnitude. It's still the age of the universe, right? Still so, yeah. uh, and that's just for one realization, you know. So what that means is, mm. is a very important thing that everyone who does these climate models they're no fools. They understand that. I mean, they understand that th that this problem has to exclude a lot of the microscopic things that uh, that uh, uh, go on in the actual atmosphere and oceans, in order to say anything at all, right? I mean, they, you know. So if someone said, "Okay, Chris, you have to give me a climate model solution within a reason, a lifetime, or less than a lifetime." what would you have to do? Well, what you would do is you could, uh, you, you would work with the grids, a much smaller grid space, a much smaller number of grid points, which is a much larger one. Now, you can, some people in, in meteorological models, they can get them smaller in climate models. So when I was doing it, there were 1,000 kilometers, but uh, nowadays they're probably, you know, maybe about 100. And they, there's a trade-off there because you get to a smaller, uh the grid spacings then you have to to speed things up you have to be even more simplistic with the uh processes that you're kicking out mm -hmm. so some people can get smaller grid spacings but they pay a price for that so there's they call it sub grid scale phenomena but to be popular or to understand get people to understand what that actually means is that you're not following the actual physics you're not solving the actual equations for anything smaller than that grid spacing. So everything you put in there, which in the case of 100 kilometers or hundreds of kilometers, like whole thunderstorms, is all fake. It's all cartoons. It's all painted like Leonardo painting a mustache on, on Mona Lisa or something like that. It's, uh, it's all, it, it, and you know, I mean, it, it sounds, I'm trying to be harsh with the language, but I'm not, but I, I also want to give the due to the people who do these kinds of things, that this is the best that we can do. So I'm not, I'm not saying these people are fools and they don't know this, but it's the problem mm -hmm. is the wider public doesn't understand that. Now, or people who are using these models have never gone in depth into what's in them. They tend to think of them as the true physics that's been integrated in time in the classical sense and it's pure, but it's not, and it's it's a kind of a cartoonized thing, and that even that wouldn't be so bad because it would give people some kind of a thumbnail sketch of what might be happening, and people can understand how maybe the different processes are interacting with each other and so forth. But to use it for policy is a whole different thing, and I think there are a lot of questions that need to be asked that are not even addressed, and I think that's partly because the policy side of this subject is completely over uh, overpowering the scientific side of this subject. So people are more yeah. concerned about what what policy issues are than the yeah. inherent flaws of what they're doing. So this obsession with 
taking this very complex computer model and then gathering up all the values of the temperature field and then averaging them and then saying this is what the climate is 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 kind of a dead end i mean it's not going to take us anywhere it's it's uh we've taken that kind of thinking as far as it's going to go and um anything else continuing to work on it we're we're we're, we're lost i mean so uh all right. Now, before before we went live, uh, I told both of you that I expected tonight would be something of a free for all, and uh, it's already turning into that. And I'm excited. I'm I'm delighted that that's happening. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, uh, I also mentioned that the two of you would come at this from somewhat different angles. Uh, Chris, you're more into the physics and the 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 uh, uh, pretty pretty sophisticated mathematics of this. Uh, David, you come at it more as a uh, climatologist, meteorologist. Um, how would you uh, how would you interact, David, with what Chris has just said? Well, I generally don't disagree with anything he said. Um, um, my concern has been that there's. I, I once got into a discussion. Let me tell, tell you this. Uh, back at the University of Oklahoma, and it was a. Uh, a fa another faculty member, I think, and, and I were discussing this problem. He said, you know, we take all the physics that we know, the best science, and put it in, and uh, we run the equations. And I said, you know very well that it's not necessarily any better than statistics, which in, in some circles, uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, is, is you know, the low-order math. It's the, you know, there the are people lies who can't really do the math and physics. Them. Well, well, yeah, but you, the people who aren't good enough to do real math are doing statistics. Um, and he said, no, there is none of that in there. And I said, come on, you know, you've got a bulk parameter coefficient. Uh, all, you know, what that really is, is a regression coefficient where you just have a little bit better idea of what the equation looks like, but you don't know what the process is. So you're just throwing it all into this one term that looks like a regression coefficient. And he really had no answer because that's exactly what it was, is that, it's, it's just an assumption that's thrown in to make the models look good. And one of the things that has bothered me, particularly after reading this article, is it seems to ignore something that happened or a paper that was published in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, which is the flagship journal of the AMS, uh, in March of 2017. And it was the Art and Science of Climate Model Tuning. And let me um, read just briefly from there. Uh, there's like 15 different authors, and it says, with the increasing diversity in the applications of climate models, the number of potential targets for tuning increases. There are a variety of goals for specific problems and different models may be optimized to perform better on a particular metric related to specific goals, expertise, or the cultural identity of a given modeling center. They went on to say, one can imagine changing a parameter which is known to affect the climate sensitivity to keep both this parameter and the equilibrium climate sensitivity in the anticipated acceptable range. Essentially what that's saying is that this model is tuned to give you the, the answer of climate sensitivity that we think is real. So assuming that if your assumption is that you take the model and you put the best available physics into it and you run it and see what happens, uh, that's not necessarily the case because a lot of these equations, we, you know, come down to these bulk parameter coefficients, which are no more than statistical, uh, uh, statistical um, regression coefficients. And so you select what it is to get you the right answer, which, you know, depending upon uh, what answer you get can make you lots of money or can cause you to go out of business. And so that's become sort of my problem is that it's not just pure physics, there's an awful lot of statistics in there. And that's the problem is statistics is just a shorthand way of saying, when I don't know what's happened, we'll make something up to get by. And maybe what we've made up isn't correct. Yeah, I see yeah. David, yeah. Uh, David's approach to it as completely complementary to the approach that I'm taking. So it's a necessary yeah. thing to do to look at the actual data and so on. But I'd like to take this idea of just statistics a bit further. There, when it comes to taking a bunch of data points and uh, putting a simple expression through it, there are an infinite number of ways to do that. And uh, you can invent all kinds of uh, interest. So it becomes after a while a kind of art. It's like 
and I, I use the analogy as like a cartoon. And, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I don't mean to put it down. I mean, I think that, that these kinds of uh, quasi empirical models are very important, especially in engineering. And uh, the way in which engineering retains its credibility with these, these uh, uh, empirical style models is uh, that uh, say you want to find out about uh, turbulent flow over a wing. What you'll do is you can use the computer to kind of figure a little bit of that out and you want to get some of these bulk parameters that David is talking about. So you put the wing into a wind tunnel and you make a bunch of measurements and you find the best thing that works. And so you can do this kind of experimental approach uh, to actually empirically come up with a pretty darn good reliable expression of what's going on. The problem with climate models is that you can't, there's no lab bench that you could put the planet Earth on and do experiments on. So you can't compete, complete the other side of the engineering empiricism of doing an experiment. So you do, you can just go and look at the, at what you see in nature and say, well, this is pretty good. But what you will never know is you'll never know is if there is some kind of qualitative change in climate, that these numbers will stay the same. It is entirely possible that the, the best number using your own criteria will be a different value in a new climate. So the whole system can't uh, uh, respond to uh, what possibly might happen in climate change in yeah. these kinds of empirical models. So the best thing you're doing is you're assuming these constants that you built into the model are 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 going to be actual constants of nature and there's no reason to do that and we have a term for it is called extrapolation so it's a well-tempered extrapolation machine you know i think uh, i think that in my very unsophisticated layman's way of putting it that's sort of what i was trying to get at when i said early on that you know that there are all these different components of the climate system where we can't actually measure them for sure. And in some instances, we don't even know whether as feedbacks, they would be positive, enhancing a given effect, or negative, reducing that effect under even present circumstances, let alone future circumstances. And therefore, uh, we, we do wind up doing a lot of this tuning that David was talking about. now. Again, I'm not a mathematician. I'm certainly not a modeler. I'm not a, a, a climate scientist. But when I hear tuning, well, I am a bit of a musician. I sing. I've sung for many, many years. And uh, I know that, that uh, if something is set too high, it gets out of my range. But if we were to retune the orchestra to bring the, uh, to bring the, the uh, pitch down even half a step, it'd stay in my range. So this, this notion of tuning is, is really, I think, very insightful um, in that what it tells us is that what we're doing with the models is, <coughs> as, uh, David, I think you quoted something about an anticipated range for results. Uh, if, if, we, if we hit a tuning fork in front of an, uh, an orchestra, the the first violinist may actually be you know a full step flat or a full step sharp but by tuning that violin she can get right on pitch and then everybody else in the orchestra follows the first violinist that's the tuning that goes on the problem is it seems to me we don't have a tuning fork for the earth that's what you're saying chris about you know we can't put we can't put the earth on a lab table and find out whether the tuning that we've done with the models makes any sense. David, I see you ready to say something. Well, yeah, I, I used to play saxophone. The easy thing about saxophone is you can tune to one note and then all the other notes are fixed. What I'm thinking is based on what Chris said, this is more like tuning a piano and all we can tune is the middle C. So I can make that one as close to reality as I possibly can, but there's no way to see other scenarios. So I can't see what Another happens if you go up a notes. fifth or down a fifth, move around. And I don't know how those notes are going to respond based upon 
you know, tuning just that one value. And that's the problem. If, if I had a whole bunch of them, I could make it work. But I've only got one Earth. I've only got one scenario. And I can try to make the model work well with that one scenario. But when we start hitting it with hammers by putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or uh, increasing the output of the sun or something like that, I don't necessarily know how the Earth is going to respond because I've only tuned it to that one current value. Okay, I've used this uh, musical metaphor to explain one of the things that's wrong about the conceptualization of climate, which really resonates off of David only being able to tune one key. Because in many respects, the way in which people represent climate is they represent it as a single note, you know, so, okay, it's B flat, you know, and, and this changes to B flat. And then uh, climate changes when it changes from B flat to C, I don't know, so something like that. Um, and the, the point is that you, because it's a dynamical thing, it's not just simply a value, this constant tone of a B flat or a C flat or whatever. It, it's, and then when it changes, it changes to another note. And that's kind of what people are looking at when they're reading a, a so-called temperature for the earth. They're, they're looking at the temperature and it's changing to a different note. That's the way they're thinking. But I think if you're thinking of it from the more realistic way of, think, of what's going on with climate, what you're really saying is that there are kind of classes of weather events that are taking place and they have a certain pattern to them, which is sometimes difficult to discern. So an analogy for to that might be like, uh, you should, instead of listening to one note, you should be listening to uh, not just a, a melody, you might be listening to a bunch of melodies done by a composer. So suppose our current climate is all the works of Beethoven. So you have one melody, you know, and it plays and plays and plays. And um, that's probably what climate is because you have different weather at different times. And sometimes it's hot and sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's wet, sometimes it's snowing, sometimes it's blowing, and something can all the different combinations of these things. So you have a melody that's kind of going, playing like music. And uh, climate change is when the system switches from Bach to another composer like Mozart. So one day, so you've created a model that will in fact do a very good job of producing artificial Beethoven type melodies. And I think you can do that. I think you can get enough notes and create a system that will actually learn a bunch of rules for generating all the works of uh, are based on all the works of Beethoven as something that Beethoven might have composed in terms of melody. And that works perfectly well until the real system switches to Mozart. And then your system doesn't work anymore. It's like you're predicting Beethoven and the system's playing Mozart. So that's what, what the, the real issue is if you want to use a musical analogy. So it's mm. just playing a different melody than the one you thought. And, and, you know, the people are saying, well, they're identifying climate change by this change in this one key. It, it, this is just not a tenable argument. It's, it's not, <laughs> that's not climate. I mean, this, this average of, of mm -hmm. uh, whatever it is that they're, whichever average they're doing is not climate. And, uh, and I mean, yeah. if you actually analyze it in a, in a, 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 a very careful and detailed way, you realize it doesn't make any sense. I mean, in the sense, for example, you, you could have climate change without any change in that average value at all. And where everyone is experiencing different weather patterns. And you can also have climate, uh, stationary climate change where that number is changing. It's, it's not mm -hmm. connected to what people really experience on the ground in real weather. And so it's become a kind of tradition for a number of decades since the 1960s at least to just think of it that way and so even when you build a vast model out of it you still have to turn it back to the 1960s version in order to interpret it and so that's it's just a kind of a dead end and i think that dead end has been created for us by the terrible interest that policymakers have in this subject and if they would kind of back yeah. off for a few years we might be able to make some progress <clears throat> Yeah, um, uh, Gerald Mell at the uh, NCAR Mesa Laboratory said, and I, I included this in what I read from the uh, Wall Street Journal article earlier. He said, we've made these models into a tool to indicate what 
could happen to the world. This is information that policymakers can't get any other way. And yet, based on the rest of this article and other things that uh, have come out of NCAR, it's very clear that, frankly, there isn't a lot of credibility to the results that come from these models in terms of there being accurate descriptions of how Earth's climate system would respond to this or that change in uh, different parameters, uh, different uh, different forcings, and so on. And so, I would say I, it goes. Beyond I have to ask myself what what's the point I mean, if policymakers are are demanding this information, but the information really uh, can't carry the load that's being asked of it. Doesn't there come a point where where what uh, honest, responsible scientists need to be saying to these policymakers, you're asking of us something that we just can't give you, even with a new, brand new $40 million supercomputer? Uh, I, 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 I have to say that in many respects, the whole problem is itself ill-posed. So what policymakers would get from this, I'm not entirely sure, except that they will proceed with their agenda of what they were going to do anyway. And I think that's, and they just can point C, well, science tells us this and, uh, and then continue. I mean, I think that's how, the, how, how uh, these things really go in the real world. But uh, it, the idea of, of these numbers, I mean, if you actually look even at the, at all of these very detailed calculations and you look at the vertical axis and you see, well, you know, there's a change of 0.3, 0.4 degrees Celsius. Okay, I mean, that's, that, that's the maximum. And if you look on a classical mercury thermometer and you just look at the, the little red uh, fluid that's in the, uh, the chamber that goes up and down, and you can see that they don't bother marking those classical thermometers more than up to about two degrees because the assumption is that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between some number and two degrees more. It would hardly make a difference to you and you wouldn't have a very good feeling for it. But yet we're contending that that point to one degree and in this, this whatever this is, uh, is something of profound importance. And, and if you push this idea a little further and you say, well, wait a minute, this is uh, what's called anomaly and uh, it's not actually a temperature. And so that's because it's right. compared to a moving 30 degree, 30, 30 year average. So that means that to convert that number to an actual thermodynamic temperature, there you have to go through a moving scale. So that isn't actually quite kosher. I mean, that's uh, okay. So let's just say that we'll use the standard uh, temperature that uh, the ISO uses as a standard for measuring outside temperatures. And that, that number is 15 degrees, which Celsius, which uh, comes to 288 degrees, which is the uh, temperature of the earth that's common in radiative convective models as the standard to 288 Kelvin. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and so if you, say, well, let's take these 0 0.3, 0 0.2 degree things you see and stick it onto the Kelvin scale using this sleight of hand here, and you plot what <laughs> the models do and what the atmosphere does. That number is what goes into the physics formulas. The, the, the anomaly doesn't go in there. The actual number at absolute time, temperature is what is actually the one that's physical. And if you plot the actual physical number over time, what you get is you get all the lines, all the temperature lines that from all the models and from observations, all falling on top of each other and being a horizontal line. You can't see the, these variations in that. So that straight line, that horizontal line in which models are ex extremely accurate in terms of this number, <laughs> because they're all fall on top of each other up to the precision and absolute temperature. Um, is somehow responsible for causing all kinds of things like, you know, um, causing droughts, causing floods, causing droughts and floods at the same time, 
I don't know, killing the Loch Ness Monster and uh, melting lights and all kinds of things that just are completely crazy. And that is the basis of our modern policy thinking, this horizontal line causing the extinction of redheads, I think was one of the ones I thought was pretty good. Uh, these are these are all these are all <laughs> the psychiatric problems, everything else. There was a there was a um, an emergency room doctor in British Columbia who uh, wrote down uh, uh, climate change as one of the causes of the illness that the, uh, the patient had. And they, this, this guy was backed up by other doctors as well. So, I mean, if he's going to operate that way, maybe I should comment on COVID. But I mean, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, some, <laughs> some the, researchers okay. at the Karolinska <laughs> Institute in Sweden just released uh, a study in which they concluded that uh, a 1.3 degree increase in global uh, Fahrenheit in global average temperature, whatever that means, Chris, you would perhaps have some comments about that, would would cause a 6.3% increase in hospitalizations for low salt content in the bloodstream, uh, hyponatremia. Uh, which, by the way, is a, a, a condition that my wife suffered about a year ago. Uh, wow. And basically, this is something that lots of athletes go through when they, they run a whole lot and they sweat like crazy and they lose a whole lot of salt from their bodies. And uh, they, they suggested, these researchers at Karolinska, that uh, this is another reason why, of course, we need to be, uh, we need to, need to be mitigating and preparing to adapt to Climate change. Well, of course, the solution is on pretty much everybody's breakfast table. It's called a salt shaker. And you just <laughs> consume a little more salt and pretty well take care of that. And, you know, I, I think we could probably put more salt on a whole lot of people's tables for a lot less than even just the $40 million extra for the one brand new supercomputer at NCAR, uh, let alone all the other supercomputers that are working on this stuff. And all the scientists whose salaries are being paid for this. Uh, we're spending billions of dollars every year on climate change uh, science. And, uh, you know, a little salt might make a difference. Forget about the fact, of well, course, that, I, that uh, greenhouse warming happens primarily toward the poles, primarily in the winter, primarily at night, raising low temperatures and having little effect on high temperatures. So you don't have any real increase in heat waves, but you have a reduction in cold snaps, which kill 20 times as many people per day as heat waves do. You know, but this is, this is how it seems to me you get a kind of a, a, a myopic, uh, tunnel vision uh, by so many climate scientists, and then they start uh, trying to 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 extrapolate causation and uh, attributing various different problems to climate change, where the evidence of such attribution is just uh, you know scant to non-existent. Well, attribution theory is another really problematic thing, but. Uh... Um, uh, yeah, I just want to make a distinction here because there's, uh, and this is something that's very common in the modern world, especially when it comes to something technical. So there are people who are doing sort of sensible or quasi sensible things. So I think that it's worth do, getting a giant computer and trying the best you can with this. I think that's still worth doing. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's not something that's appropriate for policy making. Okay, so so that Good doesn't mean that the people who are working are, are 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 charlatans or evil or anything like that. They're not. I mean, mm -hmm. but people who start getting into this uh, um, medical maladies from climate change, I think, have gone over the line. And then when you get into even sillier things like uh, the Loch Ness monster being killed by climate change, that was also in the news. Uh, some years ago, and so it, you know, I mean, there, there are so like different gradations of this stuff, which are like this gigantic tail which pulls on the science and and pulls it into funny funny directions, and in the process, we're not able to really think seriously about the science itself. And there's a lot of mm -hmm. very deep aspects to this subject, which it's not. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people who say, oh, well, you know, it's just energy in and energy out. It's a big thermodynamics pro problem. And, and well, it's not. And 
one of the things I, I love to point out is that even this winter here in Canada, we had, uh, where I was, uh, we had uh, temperatures lower than, than, uh, than they would be with no atmosphere at all. And uh, that's kind of contradicts the idea of a blanket keeping us warm, which is the usual idea. So if you think the greenhouse effect is something that's so real and everything else, how do you square that fact that you can have temperatures like minus 40 degrees in Winnipeg uh, and in, 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 in uh, Edmonton and so forth? You can have temperatures that cold, which are as cold and minus 40 degrees. I don't have to say Celsius or Fahrenheit because they're the same value. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. <both> scale, so. <laughs> uh, so, but you can get those on the ground which is way colder than it would be if there was no atmosphere at all so how does that happen and once you start answering that question you start to realize that this is a much deeper problem than we think it is mm. and yeah. uh, and well you know david a little <laughs> bit ago we had a comment from somebody uh on our youtube uh channel um, a 40 year career meteorologist. Uh, hope we can get that back up here. He says, as a meteorologist with 40 years of experience, I find it hard to believe models out years when the models start to diverge after a week. Uh, David, your experience as a state climatologist uh, and you've dealt with this a lot. Sometimes I will hear defenders of uh, climate models uh, predicting what, what we'll have a hundred years from now as that's credible, whereas meteorological models, uh, you begin to diverge within a week or perhaps 10 days for some really good models under really good circumstances. The, the, the climate scientists will say, yes, but climate is a very different thing from weather which is certainly true, weather being short-term and local and climate being long-term and generally larger scale. Um, and, and we think that we can do this longer term with climate models than the meteorologists can do with weather models. Ta talk to that for us, help us understand that those of us who are neither meteorologists nor climatologists. Well, actually, that was one of the questions I was going to pose to Chris, um, but I'll get to that in a minute. I think one of the, the misconceptions people have is that climate models are somehow numerical weather prediction models just run beyond the two-week period, and you keep going, and after 15, 20 years, you've got an average, and whatever the average it says is what your climate forecast is going to be. They are completely different beasts. There are things that happen on uh, weather scales that are important that we do not need to worry about on climate scales. Um, and there are things that happen on climate scales that must be included that you could ignore on um, weather scales. So these are not just simply the same model run longer. They're completely different, different beasts. I mean, you don't need to worry about, you know, a lot of the seasonal fluctuations in trying to forecast what's going to happen the next uh, up to that 10 days. But if you're going to do that with climate, you'd better have Milankovitch variables in there. You'd better have all of the other changes that are going to happen in the next 100 or 200 years or whatever kind of scenario you're going to run. And, and, and it's a good segue into this. This is something that came up, um, I guess it was late last week. Uh, I had written an article uh, defending Jordan Peterson, um, and uh, I took some flack from the uh, Daily Kos, um, and they said essentially a great uh, scientific journal. Well, yeah, I know, uh, but they they essentially uh, claim uh, complained that um, I was defending Jordan Peterson, and he doesn't understand how weather climate models work. And they said, unlike as Legates and Peterson suggest. Climate models get more accurate over time, not less as Peterson and Gates want you to think because they're entirely different from weather models. And I agree they're entirely different, but not for the reasons that are about to come up. And they said, one climate scientist we spoke to, uh, couldn't name names, of course, explained that climate models are boundary value problems. They look at averages across the system, oh while weather models are, are initial value problems predicting specific outcomes. 
So the idea is a weather model would try to predict what's going to happen tomorrow, and it would become more difficult to predict, essentially. Um, it, it's fairly easy to predict what's going to, what it's going to be in another hour, a little harder in a day, a little more in a week, and probably impossible in the next month. On the other hand, if you've got a weather, a climate model, it's easy to predict because the farther out you go, the more observations you have. And when you're calculating average statistics, um, you get a, uh, a better estimate as to what the future is going to look like. So let me throw this back to Chris and say, you know, can, maybe you can better explain than I can the difference between weather and climate models and the difference between boundary value problems and initial value problems. Yeah, that's um, that's a real bromide that flows around in uh, certain communities. They make this distinction, and there's a, a there's a good reason why they make this claim. <clears throat> but I think it's a problematic claim in in, in many respects. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how deeply I want to go into this. But one of the things that's attracted me and kept me in connection with the climate problems is I think of this as a problem of basic fundamental physics. I don't think of it as a, an engineering problem using 19th century physics on computers, which is, I think, commonly what, but um, one of the things that's really remarkable about the universe that we live in is uh, that it the universe divides itself up into these regimes. So you have subnuclear physics, and then you have nuclear physics, and then you have uh, atomic scales and then you have kinetic theory and then these things are all part of the universe that it's part of who we are you have quantum mechanics and you have classical mechanics you have relativities the general and special and then you have and and they all have to mesh together and it's a it's a really amazing feature that these things are can function somewhat independently you can you can go Quantum mechanics can be true, but you don't need quantum mechanics in order to visit the grocery store. I mean, it's it's something you can ignore, but it's part of the world. The net the material we're part of it, and so the question I've asked myself from the beginning is: Does that this range of separate physical regimes by scale does that end in our laboratories and the classical world of our everyday world? Or are there more of these regimes? Are we just kind of a middle regime where there's larger structure that's not seen by us because it's so big and so slow that we are, it's invisible to us just like the atomic world is. So we are like the atoms in that particular picture. And I think that climate has to be thought, that way, thought of that way, that there's this regime that can ignore the laboratory scales in some sense. But how to do that is a very, very hard problem. And one of the, the first indications of how, how hard a problem that was was something that was figured out in the 19th century by a, a physicist named Reynolds who talked about fluid mechanics and tried to deal with the subject of turbulence. And this opened up one of the most fundamental problems in science to this day. It's called the closure problem of turbulence. And uh, uh, that's very interesting. Can you actually talk about averages of flow in a pipe, for example? And if you have a turbulent flow in a pipe, uh, then you are not even not able to com compute the flow from first principles. You can't even calculate the first order average because of the turbulent flow and because of the closure problem. And you have to resort to all kinds of uh, approximate methods to make some kind and maybe some experiments to make something out of it. Well, uh, in the 20th century, there, there's a guy by the name of Barry Saltzman who said, well, okay, maybe I can, climate's different, and maybe I can take the equations of fluid mechanics and I can average them and exploit the fact that I've, I'm talking about huge scales of space and time. And uh, he tried for many years, and he tried all kinds of things, and breaking the equations apart and doing infinite series expansions and things like that. And one of the things he did actually uh, turned out to be something that inspired another meteorologist by the name of Ed, Edward Lorentz. And Lorentz actually simplified what 
Barry Saltzman did and came up with the famous uh, Lorentz equations, which became a, a kind of revolution in the late 20th century in, in how science was unfolding. And there's a couple of good points to make. First of all, going back to Barry Saltzman, he was unable to, he gave up on the idea of closing the equations for climate purposes. And he actually went towards, well, maybe just make a giant computer model in the future. And that's what people are trying and okay, good for them, let them try that. Um, but one of the unintended or unexpected consequences of Barry Saltzman's work was Lorenz's work, which opened up a whole different way of looking at systems, nonlinear systems, dynamical systems, and so forth. Um, so you have these sensitivity properties where, where um, meteorologists used to call this natural variability. But if you have two slightly different ways of places to start, the solutions or that, you know, which is the real physical behavior, if these equations represent the real world, would diverge very, very quickly. And that's one of the reasons why we can't um, uh, forecast the weather because uh, they, di they diverge. But the other property, which they often leave out because you can have divergence even with linear equations, but nonlinear equations, you have this attracting set. So the solutions never escape from those. And so that's why it's more like real weather because it, yeah, maybe you get the wrong pressure and the wrong wind and everything else, but it doesn't suddenly explode to infinity or something like that. It, it stays within normal believable end. So there's this boundedness that's associated with it. So this is an, an intrinsic property of these equations and it, it gets mimicked in the actual computer solutions and they have sensitivity problems as well. And the way in which they deal with that is, is a kind of strange thing. And, and I can't blame them because I can't think of anything better to do. But the idea is that you take the calculation and you, you do it and then you do it again with slightly different initial conditions and then again and again and again. And you take all these answers and then at each time step you can average them together and you get one kind of average solution. So it's called ensemble averaging. And then that becomes their prediction. But that's definitely not what you do with, with weather forecasts. And the irony of that is that, 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 that uh, the average uh, across an ensemble might in fact be completely wrong. I mean, it, it could be what the real system was one of those values you just threw away as not being relevant. But so the average could actually look unlike what actually happened. So it's not a convincing decisive thing, but that's what they all have this ensemble average. The other thing, yeah. you know, you get back to this question about about um, boundary value problem and initial value problems. That is a consequence of something that, again, which goes back to what David was saying about taking the uh, meteorological models and just simply, we would say mathematically, integrating them over a longer time. The, the problem with all of these things uh, is when you move them from the complete mathematics to this finite representation world is you change certain fundamental properties of the system. And uh, these are conserved quantities. So the, the original equations may conserve some things and the computer equations probably conserves different things. So even with something very simple like a pendulum, if you do the calculations, you can predict what the pendulum is going to do um, with no problem at all. Mathematically, you get a nice answer. But if you put it onto a computer, you'll get something that mimics this. But if you aren't really careful on how you do it, there's some things that are called symplectic methods which would solve and fix this. But with a normal numerical method, um, it will do things like not conserve energy, for example. And so the amplitude of the pendulum will grow over time. And for a short time, that's okay. But if you're going to really project into the future, you have a real problem. So one of the things that people don't realize about the fluid dynamics equations, they're partial differential equations. So that means that they live in a function space. So that means that there's, they're infinite dimensional. And so the number of conserved quantities you can expect are infinite in number. So when you put them on a computer, you're going to mess with those things. And so your projection into the future, the further you go in the future, the more the 
problems will start cropping up. And uh, I remember talking with some of my fluid dynamics people, friends, uh, we thought of getting one of these classical codes and just starting off with some trivial numerical uh, fluid dynamics problem. And just for the heck of it, just running it and just running it until it start just explodes in your face because of all the instabilities that uh, that come about because of the mm. fact that you fractured all these symmetries uh, by putting it on there. And uh, um, I think if you're going to, one of the remarkable things about climate models, you are doing integrations in time, which are probably the most extreme integrations in time that are done in any field of science. So you can expect instabilities to start cropping up. And indeed, that was one of the big nightmares that they used to have with early climate models. I mean, you could see it in the IPCC reports, at least the ones before they put the final draft out, where they would just say, well, look, you know, uh, uh, we're getting these negative densities and instabilities cropping up all over the place. So in order to keep the thing under control, this wild bucking bronco they had, they would introduce Rate, you know, fake energy fluxes to stabilize the thing because it would be so unstable. I mean, that, yeah. that, that, that would be one of the big problems. And so now they've come up with, mm -hmm. with um, the fake physics underneath, which does the stabilization without doing it explicitly. So now if you look at these models and what they do over very long timescales, they do nothing at all. They're completely stable. So is that, yeah real or is that isn't is that not real if it's real then these guys are right saying that the their boundary value problems because it doesn't matter where you begin you end up with the same outcome right so that's going on and going on but if they are wrong which i think they are and there's reason to think that all they've done is they've so stabilized these these models that they've actually stolen the ring from the bell that would really be there so it's completely sluggish kind of long-term behavior, which they've created. So if you push this model, instead of you know bucking all over the place, it just pushes it only to the extent that you push it. So the only way in which anything happens over a long time is if something external pushes it. This is really an important point because that means that the only way in which change can happen is if you did it, humans did it, right? I mean, and I did it. The only way it can change, but what what uh, happens if you don't do that? If you realize that there are a bunch of these very slow ocean modes, and we wrote a paper in Physica on this, these low, very slow ocean modes uh, that are in the oceans that are very long time scale, and this gets into this business I was talking about of how we're like the atoms. If you go on a very long time scale, the physics is cares about stuff like that. Um, we think that there are these low modes, uh, slow modes that in fact are constantly forcing the system into different uh, states and regimes, even if we weren't here. So it would still be kind of slipping around back and forth. And if you now stick a kind of a pushing uh, force into it, this is the attribution aspect to it, it's going to behave very differently than just the sluggish flat white spectrum. So hmm. whether that uh, and in fact, you could have very small effects leading to big consequences, or it could just be quite insensitive to you could push it. It's like bouncing the rubble. There's there's different kinds of scenarios that can happen. And none of these things have been really carefully explored. And there's a, the, so there's a lot of really deep things to think about here that are completely outside the scope yeah. of normal discussion in this field. So you have to have... Yeah fringe lunatics like me thinking about these things and nobody cares about them and they have nothing to do with policy, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, nothing to do with policy because of course policy wants a, a, a sure answer uh, and there just are not those sure answers. What well, I think it's worse than that. that. I think they don't care. Uh, I don't care about what okay, the answer yeah, is. All right, let's... <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I, as you said earlier, they're going to do what's on their agenda, regardless uh, of what right. comes from the scientists. It's really not a matter of follow the science. It's follow the uh, follow the agenda. Um, but some people do uh, seem to want to claim, well, the models have been, you know, problematic in the past, but they're getting better and better. Um, uh, I, I sent uh, out to the two of you and to our producer in advance some 
graphs that I I might wanted uh, might have wanted to uh, to show and. Uh, I'm going to just uh, try to show one of them. Uh, this is graph number two, uh, and we'll see if we can get that up in front of us. Yeah, uh, this is a comparison done by Dr. Roy Spencer, who's a principal research time, a climate research scientist in climate at the uh, our Earth and uh, yeah the, at at the University of Alabama at Huntsville, and. Uh, he here compares the CMIP-5 and CMIP-6 models. CMIP-5 is Coupled Model Intercomparison Project Fifth Generation Models. And uh, then the CMIP-6, uh, of course, is the sixth generation. Reminds me of the old tongue twister, the sixth sick sheep, sixth sheep sick, uh, trying to <laughs> say all of this. Uh, give it a try if you want to. Uh, but uh, this is comparing the model simulations with the observations from the Hadcrute 4 uh, temperature uh, uh, record, which is you know one of several different records that uh, that even the the climate alarmists, as we might call them, tend to uh, tend to depend upon. And as you can see there, uh, the fifth generation models diverged uh, rather significantly uh, from the actual observations pretty quickly and uh, have, have not even uh, crossed them very much through the time. But the, the sixth generation models are even worse than the fifth generation models. And this is after billions of dollars spent trying to improve the models. Uh, David, why is this? Why are the computer models seeming to get farther away from the observations rather than closer to them? Uh, and, and this is, uh, it's, it's something that, that was discussed in that Wall Street Journal article that I quoted from earlier, uh, farther along in the, in the article. Uh, the fact that this most recent generation of models seemed to be yielding warming from added CO2 that was much bigger than what had been uh, predicted by the earlier generation and much bigger than was observed. And then they did some additional tuning, frankly, and seemed to get it a bit closer, but still it seemed to be significantly larger. Uh, what's going on here? Why are the models in fact, not getting better over time uh, in terms of matching actual observations? Well, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, obviously one is we've changed the physics and gotten to uh, a different set of physics. I won't necessarily base a better physics, but the problem is when you try to encompass more, uh, more factors, more observations, you've got more interactions, uh, it, it's more difficult to make sure that they're all talking correctly together and that you actually haven't essentially over-parameterized the system. Uh, part of the issue, too, is the models tend to be um, over-sensitive to carbon dioxide, which is probably why it occurs. And the other reason that uh, we looked into as well is that, you, that all of these are driven, the, the models are driven by a scenario that we believe that carbon dioxide is going to follow. See, the idea is to run the model, you need to know what the amount of carbon dioxide is going to be in 2050. And that's a question outside the climate model because the climate model will essentially require you to tell me how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere and then I can run the equations. So there are all sorts of scenarios, and I won't go into the RCPs or the SSPs, which are using now uh, the scenarios, but a lot of people tend towards the 8.5 watts per square meter bump, which essentially happens by uh, um, 2100. And that's a pretty big hammer hitting the climate model. Uh, and most people argue that is not necessarily business as usual. That is worse than business as usual, and that's probably a very rare event. Uh, and so going for those extreme uh, modeling scenarios will get you a bigger warming scene, and that usually makes it more statistically significant, uh, more 
policy significant so that your paper has more impact, your paper has more potential to be published, and all things are good in terms of uh, your future career. The problem is you're using a scenario that is is not known uh, to be, or is known, I should say, not to not be real. Um, and so, but the question is, we don't know what the real scenario is going to be. So part of the problem of climate modeling is to simulate correctly a system that we just don't understand that has lots of, as, as Chris mentioned, uh, nonlinearities, and it's an inherently nonlinear system uh, that can't easily be predicted or forecasted. And then we've got all these externalities that we don't really know what the future is going to look like in terms of what the, the external parameters are going to be to force the climate model. So when all that comes in, um, it becomes very difficult to try to figure out what's happening in the future. And then couple that with the fact that, you know, CMIP 6 is a slightly better physics model than CMIP 5. And when I say slightly better, uh, that means it has more physics, but it has more potential problems. Because as I said earlier, you've got all these things trying to work together and we don't necessarily know how they all fit. And so that's where probably why they are in a nutshell, why it's overestimating the values. One of the reasons right. why I, 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 I like the idea of your mention how they fit. Some people think that the model that all those different kinds of physics just fit together like Lego, just snap, but they don't. And, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so the art of making sure that one kind of physics is not kicking the butt of the other kind of physics because they work on different time scales and space scales and so on is part of the art of this. And I think that's where um, real in, in, intellectual value is in, is in these things, is figuring out what these problems are and trying to even understand how these things work together. I think that that's a legitimate activity. But when you mention these uh, CMIP projects, which are very popular and I guess keep doing that, I, it's funny whenever I see the CMIP ac acronym, for some reason my my mind reads it chimp. I don't know why it's a chimp two and chimp three. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's a CMIP. It's not chimp, right? Okay. Um, but uh, anyway, one of the things in, in this um, article that I was mentioning uh, in Physica A that uh, myself and uh, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Tassos Tsonis, wrote about the, uh, the issue of climate models and the nature of climate. And, whether this stuff is even falsifiable uh, with models, whether the models are falsifiable. Uh, we actually looked at uh, different generations of these CMIP, CMIP models. And what we found was an interesting thing, which was that uh, over time, as these things became more sophisticated, uh, the uh, different models from different groups tended to get more and more into agreement. They were agreeing more. But in the same time, they're also moving further away from what the nature, the actual values, nature is supposed to is supposed to say. So, so yeah. they're agreeing with each other more, but not with nature more. <laughs> so I thought that was a yeah. very interesting paradoxical result. <laughs> yeah, and we have we actually have a graph that I think illustrates that very nicely. Uh, this is graph number four that I sent out earlier. Um, <clears throat> this uh, this ranks the various CMIP-6 models versus observation. And uh, the, the two blue bars there are from observational data sets. And all the red ones are from models. And what was fascinating to me in what you just said, Chris, is that where we see the most agreement among the models is precisely where they are farthest away from the observations. <laughs> Uh, and to me, that's, that's a rather delicious irony in this whole thing. Well, Chris, David, thank you again very much for joining me tonight. We've already gone almost uh, an hour and a half. We usually go about an hour. Uh, the luxury of, of uh, live stream is that you're not stuck within a particular time frame. But I do think that we need to, to let the two of you uh, go free and... Uh, Thank you so much for joining us both tonight. Uh, brief closing comment, uh, first from you, Chris, and then from David. Well, it was really nice to have David on because uh, he just uh, happened to know where all my 
buttons were and was quite happy to push them. <laughs> it kept me all wound up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I mean, I, I mean, look, the, the, this is a subject that I think uh, is a very deep one, and I think there are a lot of really wonderful things to explore. And I, I've been spending the last few years of my career working on on uh, a project called Slow Time, where I'm modif trying to mod see how how the laws of physics get changed when you move to longer space and time scales and uh, and uh, I already have the slow time Maxwellian, to call it, and uh, I've been working on a, a slow time fluid mechanics for very, very long time scales. And uh, this is absolutely unfashionable research. It's not something you can get a grant for, but I don't care. <laughs> so, okay. Good. Well, our time tonight has not been slow. <laughs> I think it's crept on, <laughs> up on all of us. Uh, David, uh, closing comments? Well, I'm recently retired, so I'm trying to go to slow time, but uh, just can't make it there. Um, yeah, I think part of the issue is that a lot of people just don't understand what a climate model really is. And that uh, in, in particular, for example, you know, we see, uh, you know, five people run five different, create five models. They run them, they get the same answer. And we say, oh, my, that's, that's great. And usually the argument is, you know, if five people went away and came back with the same answer, it's probably robust. But here it's, in many cases, the modeling groups are using the same basic model and just making slight tweaks to it. And so a lot of people just don't understand what modeling is all about. And it's, uh, it's, it's really necessary to get your hands dirty and to play with them a little bit. But you start to get a better, different understanding of what's going on, what their uses are, and why the policy people really should go away. But... Uh, that's yeah. that's for another day. All right. Well, Amen. thank you again very much, <laughs> both of you. And uh, a few other comments before we actually go offline here. Uh, first, um, I mentioned at the beginning of the program that David is a co-author uh, with uh, Anthony Lupo of the University of Missouri of the third edition of Fred Singer's uh, outstanding book, uh, uh, Hot Talk, Cold Science, Global Warming's Unfinished Debate. Uh, that book is, uh, there we go. David's showing it right there. That book is available uh, from the Cornwall Alliance in our online store. Just go to cornwallalliance.org slash shop and you will find Hot Talk, Cold Science. Also available from our store is uh, the wonderful book, Taken by Storm, the Troubled Science, Politics, and Policy of Global Warming. And uh, Christopher Essex is co-author with our mutual friend, Dr. Ross McKittrick, of that wonderful book. And uh, so that too is available online at cornwallalliance.org slash shop. These two are really two of my very favorite books in the field of climate change. Uh, they are excellent science brilliantly written so that they are comprehensible to somebody like me. Uh, finally, I uh, would like to remind you that throughout the month of March, as our way of saying thank you when you make a uh, donation of literally any size and ask for it, we are offering to send you two copies, two copies of my booklet, Social Justice Versus Biblical Justice, how Good Intentions Undermine Justice and Gospel. Uh, to request your two copies, uh, simply go to cornwallalliance.org. That's cornwallalliance.org. And as you uh, go there, click on the Donate button. And when you're filling out the donation form, in the comments field, write in promo code 22 03 promo code 22-03 or the title social justice we'll know what you're looking for and we'll be glad to send you two free copies one for yourself one for a friend or if you already have one for yourself many of you do uh, you can give two away to friends this is particularly helpful in light of the justice uh, progressive woke uh, critical race theory uh, combination of movements 
that are in many ways uh, dividing and antagonizing uh, Americans among each other and people around the rest of the world as well. Well, thank you again for joining us tonight on From the Stacks. Uh, I hope to see you again next week. And meanwhile, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. <music>